Hello again and welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm Pat Yates. I'm not supposed to be saying I'm sitting in for Joe Valley, but I kind of am. How are you doing, Joe? Today we have a great guest with us, actually a good friend of Mark Doust, our founder, Kirk Hogsden. Kirk is with Altus Marketing and he is sites altuselevates.com. He main drive more good companies he worked with in the late nine or the nineties and early two thousands than any you could ever shake a stick at, just from Land of Lakes to Breathe Right, just a fascinating guy. I mean, he has all kinds of, of history and marketing development, partnerships and things like that. I think what's weird about marketing, we do a lot of this on the Quite Like Podcast, is it's never really a one you know, size fits all. There's always something small that someone says differently or has a history, or maybe he found out something with Breathe Right that he didn't do with Land O'Lakes. But it's amazing how Kirk has this diverse background of all these companies he's worked at, things that he's beta tested AB that knows what works and doesn't work. So if your company is out there trying to scale an e-commerce or especially trying to get into retail to position how you could uh, diversify your channels, this guy is someone you want to talk to. And it's funny as we went through the conversation, the one thing I think that entrepreneurs should always think about is reaching out and getting as much information around you as you can. We talk passionately at Quite Light about that, about how we want people to come in. You don't have to list with us. You want to come in and find out what your valuation is, how it's changed over the last year, what multiples are doing, anything that you want to know. We we are here to be able to help you. And it's funny how Kirk is the same way. He probably has as much value wide as he does on the things he's working on, giving ideas. I just think it's fascinating to hear people that have that kind of background that can come in and look at your product and say, even though it's not a one size fits all, this is ABC of what we've done in the past to make it successful. I'm fascinated to hear this today. Again, Kirk Hogston from Elevate, um, Elevating, Altus Elevates is a website that keeps messing me up. Altus Marketing is the company and I'm anxious to talk to Kirk. Let's get right to it. Kirk, welcome to the Quiet Light podcast today. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Happy to be here. Thanks. You as well. I know we've talked a lot about getting together. It's funny because you have a an acquaintance that you spend some time with up there in Minneapolis, uh, Mark Doust, our owner. I know you know Mark, correct? I do. I do. He is a great gentleman. Uh, yeah. Happy to know him. Yep. Yeah, he talked really highly of you. And I think what's amazing about this is we're so fortunate to quite like to have so many people around us like you that, you know, when people that have known Joe in the past and Chris and all the guys that are involved, we love bringing people on that that have things. So I know today we're going to talk a little bit about Altus Elevates and Altus Marketing, and that's really what you do. But truthfully, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to, to the Quite Light listeners and tell them all about yourself and how Mark's an idiot and other than that, all those good things. Make sure we talk about those things. Mark is not an idiot. We will start there. But uh, no, my background is uh, has been in consumer products. Uh, I'll, I, I won't say how many years. Uh, you know, it, when you get to a certain age and colored hair, you try and keep the numbers down. But oh, I I'm gonna, with you there. I'm going to say 35 years. Um, uh, I cut my teeth in the old days at Lando Lakes. So if you think wow. about managing... Uh, Things like ice cream and cheese and meat products and so forth. Uh, kind of uh, learned the ropes as a marketing assistant and worked my way up to marketing manager of various products. And then uh, went on from there to uh, healthcare with uh, HMO management uh, early in in kind of that industry. And then uh, um, kind of switched to the agency side of the business. And that was sort of a fun thing where um, I was hired by a promotion firm, um, U.S. Communications here in Minneapolis. And, and the claim to fame of this firm was that uh, they got involved in Star Wars licensing in the very late 70s, early 80s. So if you think of like, Dixie cups with uh, Luke Skywalker on them or Oral B toothbrushes or various things. This uh, this firm was involved in some really early great licensing and, and promotional things. And uh, at that time, I was assigned to the Oscar Meyer business. And uh, uh, many people on this podcast will be familiar with a product called Lunchables and oh, yeah. uh, you know, meat, cheese and cracker combinations. And uh I was on the original Lunchables rollout team and and kind of uh, in charge of the promotions and uh, mail-in rebates and coupons and in-store displays and uh, 
a number of elements to uh, uh, kind of get that product started and uh, was kind of a fantastic new products experience early in my career. And uh, went on to work on other accounts uh, in the uh, early days of uh, kind of um, telephone and cellular things, uh, worked on the GTE account. And that introduced me to sports marketing. They did, they sponsored the Super Bowl. They sponsored golf, uh, the PGA Tour in those days, and just uh, got some experience on the sports marketing side. And that was kind of a perfect prep for uh, being hired to uh, uh, a company called CNS, which uh, is maybe more famous as the Breathe Right Strip Company. So if you think of the little strips that go on your nose, uh, I uh, became the VP of marketing there. Uh, was VP of marketing for about five years and then switched to the business development side. And so business development, uh, I'm not sure I even knew what business development was when I switched, but uh, uh, started to concentrate on uh, helping the company grow from an acquisition standpoint and look for various acquisitions. And then also from a licensing and strategic alliance side and uh <clears throat> One of the quick highlights was we we created a breathe right strip for kids for colds. So if you had a cold, um, it would be great. And uh, we had uh, mentholated vapors built into the strip. And uh, we thought, you know, this is going to be a great product, breathe right strips with mentholated vapors. But uh, it was an even better product if we could say it was a breathe right strip with Vix vapors. Uh, and, uh, went to Procter and Gamble and met with the VIX team and the licensing team there. And uh, eventually we were able to introduce, you know, breathe right for colds with VIX vapors and uh, turned out to be a very fun thing. But uh, after my time at uh, breathe right started what is now Altus, uh, it's gone through a few I'm going to say name changes over the years, but uh, started in 2001 and and have kind of been managing uh, the business uh, ever since. So um, that is an amazing that. name drop background. Those are some big time brands that you worked with. Please tell me you got to drive the Oscar Mayer hot dog car, though. Please tell uh, me you did. I, I, you know what? Uh, I did not, but uh, that was Come the on. daughter crew. And uh, I will say when... The old corporate headquarters for Oscar Mayer is in Madison, Wisconsin. And when there's about 10 of those Wienermobiles lined up, uh, it's a pretty impressive sight. So, uh, Kirk, I I'm going to have to ding you some quality points because you did not drive the <laughs> hot dog car. There's no way the Wienermobile wasn't fired up at some point. I'd have been in that first thing when I got the job. I don't know what you were waiting on. I love anyway, it. That, that's unbelievable. So some of these brands, it's like mind blowing mm -hmm. how big and you went through the transition of those. You've probably got amazing stories but what's what's the best one if you say hey here's one that you just won't believe it was so incredible how we fell into this or it worked out what was a great takeaway well i would tell you um you know breathe right would be uh you know one of uh one of the launches if you will that would be near and dear to my heart uh when i was hired into the company um it really was a sleep technology company and delivered for lack of a better way to say it, software and, and laptops to sleep centers around the country. And the inventor of Breathe Right Strips brought the, the product to the company and said, hey, I'd love to sample this and have you guys measure the quality of sleep people get because I'm an allergy sufferer. And when I put these strips on at night, it really helps me sleep. So could you use your technology to to test that and show that you get a better night's sleep when you have this breathe right strip on and uh the uh the chairman of the company uh Dr. Dan Cohen kind of uh immediately knew as a physician he uh he knew you know what these strips are going to help with allergies they're going to help with sleep they're going to help with sports they're going to help with a wide variety of things and so I'd I'd actually like to license the product from the inventor and that relationship wow. led to me being hired and you know hiring a broker sales force to roll the product out and you know we uh I will say I'm I'm trying to think it would have been 94 I think our our goal for the year uh was uh 
about 1.7 million in sales. It's a public company, by the way, you can kind of look yeah. it up. But the next year, I think we hit 47 million in sales uh, the next year. So, so uh, you, you increased a little bit that next year, like only 47 X or so, something like that. That's real. I mean, gosh, it's such yeah. a cool way. Like looking back on that, I'm sure it was a lot to do to when you were doing it, but it's such a cool thing to talk about now that you're involved with that. Yeah, you know, um, I would tell you there were some great, you know, it was, it was a super fun time. We uh, we hired Jerry Rice to be our uh, sports spokesperson, uh, you know, who was playing yeah. for the 49ers, um, you know, really had some fun things there. We worked with NADA and the National Athletic Trainers Association, and those trainers would work with NFL teams and hand the strips out to various players. So we got a lot of visibility on TV. But the reality was snoring and congestion were really the the major uses for for the average Joe uh, at night, if you will. Um, but uh, that rollout taught me a lot about the value of PR. It taught a lot about uh, sampling. It taught a lot about retail and retail management, uh, you know, with all of the various retailers like, you know, Walgreens or Target or Walmart and so forth. And uh you know, all of those learnings led to kind of a philosophy of of uh, every business has leverage. If you can sort of find what are those uh, what are those things where just a little bit of pressure produces a lot of results. And in the early days of Breathe Right, um, that was PR uh, because you know everyone wanted to know what are those goofy strips on the noses of all of these football players. And there were a lot of writers and, and a lot of TV news crews that were interested in telling all of their viewership, you know, what are those strips on the noses? Yeah. And, and if we could tap into that PR interest, we could get really a lot of exposure and a lot of awareness really early. And, uh, and so that helped. And as we approach every business we manage, we're always looking for those little leverage points in their marketing plan where we where you know where can we be scrappy and spend a little bit of money and and get a lot of benefit out in return so you know low investment high return is always the best way to you know kind of keep your product growing and and sure. get to the next level so it makes total sense and what's amazing about your background you're walking from some amazing builds of brands, like some huge brands, like you may talk small about it. It's really incredible. But the what the takeaway becomes as you do that growth, you pick up so many things. So if you fast forward into Altus Marketing, you walked in with all this knowledge and PR and able, ability to take people's products to market. And I know as we talked a little bit about that, you're kind of concentrate on really three steps and three things, marketing, communications, technology, strategic development, things you do at all. So tell us about that organization and how you try to take the, the history of those successes, except for not driving the wiener mobile. How did you apply that to people's businesses and take them forward and, and help them gain that kind of success? Sure. Um, you know what? I think that, um, you know, in, in the, at the basic level, one of the things that makes us different is, is that we really approach it from a business background. I'm a big believer in what I call napkin math. It's part of our philosophy. And it's kind of like for any business, um, if you can't write down how, how you make money, like this is how we make money on the back of a napkin, um, something's wrong or it's too complex. And, uh, and so the idea for most of our you know, manufacturing partners is, you know, I have cost of product and I make a product and I distribute that product and it gets to retail or it goes right. through e-commerce and Amazon. But in the end, I need to understand the margins of that product and how I make money. And from a consulting standpoint, you know, if you don't understand that, how can you possibly make PPC investment decisions or, or how can you say, oh, I want to go advertise the product right. or or what have you, you can't make those decisions in a vacuum. So we really, we start by understanding that napkin math and making sure that we know how you do business. And then again, we're looking for those leverage points, be they on the e-commerce side or, or on the retail side. And uh, we attract a lot of companies that again, are, are trying to level up and trying to find unique ways to get their product successful either at retail or 
you know, with Amazon or with other, you know, Shopify or, or their own website. So um, I, I would say that uh, understanding those things is, is huge. We're data oriented. We, we do have a relationship with a sales broker group that gives us access to what is called, uh, well, it's now Circana, but I'll say IRI data. And this would be data that is tracking every product in every store. So um, you're you're able to manage and kind of understand how you're doing at retail, how much distribution do you have, and uh, without that knowledge, you're you're kind of managing blind, wondering how am I doing at my various retailers or across the yeah. country, and uh, and so we can help people with that data. And that allows us to be smarter about how do we approach the buyer at Target or the buyer at Walgreens sure. and have a good conversation about why we deserve to be on the shelf. So um, it varies by client, but I would say, um, you know, it all harkens back to us, you know, being smart about how are we going to work together and what kind of money does it make sense to invest in these endeavors. So. That's really incredible. I think, you know, we we talk at Quiet Light really passionately about, you know, preparation and making sure people really truly understand, you know, what it's going to take to exit at maximum value. And sometimes details just truly matter. Listening to what you're talking about, I, I mean, I envision there's a lot of people out there that say, you know what, I, I don't either can't afford it or I don't need it early on. And they go out and get us try to get a start in their business growing into these markets and they sort of make some mistakes that you can save them time for. What where what portion of their the business do they become right to work with you? Do they have to have a certain level of of sales markets they're in? Let's say someone's introducing a new product. What's the best kind of client for you at Altus? Well, I would say we we work from entrepreneurs up to uh, you know a, as we talked earlier, I'll say divisions of larger companies. Um, but in in general, we are very adept at you know people that are just kicking off an investment and and uh, you know selling their product in limited e-commerce areas um, to others that are are trying to get to retail. You know, the beauty of e-commerce and, and Amazon, um, I think my latest stats for, you know, consumer packaged goods and, and a lot of healthcare products is that e-commerce is now for, for many product categories, averaging about 30% and stores, you know, would be the other 70% in general. And so when e-commerce is you know, number one, when it's 30% of your business, you you need to know it and understand it and pay attention to it. But the other thing is that it just so much, uh, it, it's changed the, the nature of the investment for the entrepreneur in terms of how much you need to put into a business and to figure out whether it can be successful or not. So yeah. we think it's really smart. You know, most people are are going to have their website and they're going to have Amazon to start with. And uh, there are so many things you can learn about, you know, how are consumers searching for your product? Um, how are they interested in it? What kind of need is it fulfilling? How can you benchmark it with other successful products? How big could it be? Um, those are all things that you can learn on Amazon. And uh, and as um, most of our, our business owners would know out there, there are lots of things that you can test. So the the beauty of digital sales is you can be a B testing, you know, a lot of things with regards to, you know, what works and what doesn't work and why not test it at a much, you know, I'll say an inexpensive level when you decide to go to retail and sell your products, you know, to stores. Uh, the reality is the 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 quantities and the risks get much higher, much quicker. Right. And so, you know, if you're if if Walgreens says I want to order your product for my nine thousand stores, well, the reality is that's going to be a big order, and that's really good news. But the other side of that is, if you don't sell well off the shelf, that could be a really big return back to your right. your your facility. So um, you have to be prepared and and uh, know where to invest. But I think we can help customers with those decisions and getting it right on uh, Amazon and getting it right on your own website first is usually a, a really great step for most people. And uh, so we've developed that, <clears throat> I'm going to say the 
the Amazon Outlook and the tools to help people do that, you know, in a pretty good way. So it's a really interesting point, you know, that I, I've been an e com entrepreneur for a lot of time, a long time. You know, I was on Shark Tank. We had a lot of retail opportunities after that. Our product's really not built for the the retail environment. But what was interesting about it, we did a lot of specialty kiosk business, which sort of built our our web business. So it was a great way to build a funnel and be able to, to build a lot of understanding about it. The more that retail and especially, especially retail got worse, it became much more difficult to navigate. And that's where I'm kind of interested. Like some people, if they don't have an understanding of retail, let's say they're very good in e-com, they think just because I do a good job in e-com, retail is completely different and vice versa. So do you, do you really believe that if someone's successful in one of those sides and then they're going to venture into the other, that they should just assume they can, or is it better to reach out someone like you and be able to get that base down and, if they don't know what they don't know, like we say, what, yeah. what's the best way? Should they always approach it first and see because of that? Well, I think the the one thing that I would tell you is is it's going to vary by product. So I think you know it. Uh, I think it's hard to make assumptions without knowing the product and and where it fits in the category and that sort of thing. Um, I think there is certainly. There's data out there that would say, hey, if I, I don't know, I'm making it up. If you if you develop a melatonin product to help people sleep better, um, the reality is we can look up the data on the e-commerce side and on the on the retail side and say, you know what, we can see that there are other products that are selling well. And and for lack of a better way to say it, there are interested consumers that want to buy a product like this. Um, and so those kinds of, you know, like if you've got a, uh, uh, I'll say a better mousetrap, but you're in the mousetrap category, um, then, then I think it's easy to predict or easier to predict how you might do at retail, especially if you have a point of difference. Um, as you look to other categories, uh, it might, or, or innovations, like you have a brand new solution to a need, um, that that one is is where we might want to learn more digitally at lower cost right. to determine whether retail makes sense. Um, the other thing is is retail is much more specialized. So in the old days, there were a lot more retailers to go to and a lot more stores to try and figure out. Nowadays, you know that might be ten to fifteen major retailers that you have to figure out and. Uh, and the reality is you might not be right for all of them. If uh, if you're a pet food company, um, you know, the reality is Chewy and certain pet food retailers might be all the retailers you need to get to. And, uh, right. you know, worrying about other retailers just doesn't make sense. So um, it, it's going to vary a little bit, but I think, you know, um, hopefully that's good thinking for most people. You know, you make a really good point, and it's actually when you take a step back from maybe if someone says, hey, I'm ready to go for retail, they just go wide and they think, let's try everything we can go. Let's throw this cast a wide net. Mm -hmm. I think what you just said is kind of interesting because if someone comes in, it's better to have you guys like analyze their product and say, hey, this may be great for you, but this isn't. And this would be and I'd stay away from this. I, I would think if you look at the product, do you usually have a good idea of what markets can be successful based on some of the historical data you have? Yeah, I think so, and I and I think um, that that can be both historical data and and real data. The other thing, by the way, is is that Amazon is is a great tool to use and analyze for how well are you know are there some competitive products on Amazon, and how well are those products selling, and what's my point of difference compared to those products, and so. You know, I, I would call this like size of the prize thinking or, or you know, consulting, if you will, which is like, OK, here's my product. How big could this be? Right. Like you had your business selling at kiosks. And, and is this a you know, is this a one million dollar business or a 50 million dollar business and why? And, right. uh, and so, you know, thinking through that and being realistic about it. Um, can help you. And then, by the way, you know, whether you introduce line extensions or new items in the same category, um, that can be something that will expand your business as you go forward. You don't you don't just have to have one SKU or one line of uh, of products, too. So uh, there's uh, but I, I do think um, in the old days, one other thing I'll say about retail that the the old philosophy was, get your product on all the shelves, like get it out there. 
and then spend money on what I would call mass media, which would be TV and radio and print and other things to tell a lot of people about your product. And then they will, now that they're aware of it, they're going to go out and buy your product because everywhere they shop, it's available to them. Well, nowadays, that's just much harder. You're not going to get into all of those retailers at the same time. You don't really have a proven track record. Um, And so being more creative about that, like, hey, uh, I have a I have a super great product. I want to take it to Target and work with them and show them the potential of my new business and new category And maybe I want to give them an exclusive for a year and not introduce it to any other retailer because I want to get my my product going with them and and they're going to invest in my business. So um, and by the way, you have to have a very special product. But if you look at brands like, I don't know, Ollie and brands like Method and, you know, all of these brands kind of exclusively started at a target and got introduced sort of at that lone retailer. And so partnering up or having a strategic alliance with a particular retailer, you know, might be a strategy that could be a good one, you know, from from that standpoint. Um, is, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was going to say one other one other big concept for people to recognize too is that media has sort of flip-flopped and uh, if you're familiar with you know, the Amazon Media Network or Walmart now has Walmart Connect. What's happening is that retailers are creating their own media networks. And uh, so, you know, on Amazon, if you have a video that is essentially your commercial for your product, um, you know, you can do video streaming to Amazon targeted audiences and then track whether those people are coming back to Amazon in the next 30 days or the next 60 days to buy that product. So if you think about, um, you know, investing in that network and then determining whether it's paying out and and there's an ROI to actual advertising on a one-to-one basis, um, it's kind of an exciting thing. Usually, those 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 media options didn't exist. And if they did exist, they were very, very expensive. And now, you know, we could do a test with with a client uh, for, you know, ten thousand dollars on Amazon to figure out, you know, will my product respond to some advertising to the right target? So, um, yeah, Yeah, that's incredible. It's funny because I've talked about that. We have an NFL line that I've talked about how the NFL changed their Sunday ticket to YouTube TV, which really changes advertising. People don't think much about that. It's a little bit different. There's a lot of ways to build content and do other things that, you know, you have the ability to market to. And it's great that you guys are doing that as well. So back again, we're with Kirk Cox and with uh, Altus Marketing. When you're at Altus, I was struck by this reading the site. You can pretty much come to you with conceptual idea and you can help them develop market and then eventually just probably even talk to market exit their business. So no matter start to finish, if they have an idea and want to figure out how to go down this path, they can come to you and just start from inception, correct? Even if they're trying to get conceptual marketing and, and development ideas. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I would say we're we're typically engaging when somebody is further in the process, like they've got their product and they've uh, you know, they've tested it with consumers and and or they've attempted to grow some things on their own website. But the reality is, um, you know, we are working with real entrepreneurs that just, you know, have an idea or they, they've got a patent on something and they're not sure how to proceed at this point. Um, the other thing, you know, we have a client right now that, you um, frankly, is uh, a university in Wisconsin that that uh, one of their professors basically created a patent around uh, some really good biology, and uh, they're trying to turn that into a product line in the cosmetics area. And so, um, you know, like that is from ground zero that that a lot of our work is happening with those folks. And it could be super exciting what happens with that particular product. So I'm go- I'm going to say yes, but it takes you know like sort of special products and special yeah. opportunities for that to work from ground zero. That makes total sense. But I mean, what I think what we're trying to pit uh, you know paint a picture is 
there's not much that you haven't done. If they want to understand how you build a breathe right strip, if they have that, then you obviously understand that. It's really amazing. So for the listeners out here, if you if you were to give them the 30-second the, uh, uh, overview of what you do the best at Altus, if they want to come to you for the meat and potatoes or what will help grow their company, is that marketing or what is the best best areas that you can actually make impact? Yeah, I, I, you know, marketing is such a broad term. It it, it really depends. I would say that, uh, um, you know, if, if you're investing in e-commerce and Amazon right now, we can really help. Um, uh, you know, one, one of the things that we just our approach to Amazon is a little bit different because of that understanding of the P&L, understanding of your business. I think, too, that uh, people get caught up in losing sight of what their product is, and they just start to manage Amazon on a ROAS basis or, you know, here's here's my mm-hmm. financial measurement and that's what I'm going to do. And they're not considering other elements of the marketing mix, like how could PR impact your business or how could, I mean, simple exposure things impact your business? How can influencers and social media impact your business. And a lot of those uh, outside elements bring people to your product detail page and your purchase page. And frankly, your algorithm can change dramatically with with Amazon if um, you're bringing people to Amazon. I mean, all of a sudden that's going to be reflected in what your daily sell rate is. So um, I, I would just say uh, we can really help on the e-commerce side. That would be step one. And then if you get to the level where you want to entertain retail, uh, we have that in spades and can do that, you know, very professionally and probably save you a lot of heartache in terms of what are the better ways and, and best practices ways to, to get to retail. So that might yeah, be that, that's I mean, it's such a necessary thing. And I think the more that people have success in business, they're, you know, sometimes a little bit reluctant to admit, hey, I don't know how to do this next step, but it's better to learn it the right way. Having done some retail, it's never an easy thing. So, Kirk, here's one question. I think that a lot of times there are creative ways for brands to get to market partnerships, alliances, different things. Maybe there's some opportunities of things you've done in the past. It might be food for thought for someone to do that. You know what? It's uh, it's a great suggestion. One of the things that I would tell you is is we are actually the official name of the company is Altus Business Development, and uh, and uh, even though we we operate as Altus Marketing, business development is at our core. And one of my big beliefs is just one plus one often equals three. And so the idea is you have your current business. But for example, Pat, on your business, if you partnered with the NFL, could I do even better if I had a licensing agreement with somebody else and I brought that partnership together? And uh, so we're, I'm going to say, relatively uh, famous for some really good partnerships over the years and looking for opportunities where we can help our client find another company or a, or an alliance and put those things together. So Some quick examples where Radisson Hotel was uh, a client and we were able to, you know, and and by the way, in that business, a hotel room is a hotel room is a hotel room, right? Like, what's the difference between a Radisson room and a Marriott room or a Hilton room? And uh, one of the things we did is we brought the idea of, you know what, if we had sleep number beds in those rooms and uh, somebody coming to stay in their hotel could actually adjust the bed to their desired hardness or softness, that would be a real point of difference uh, between a regular hotel room and a, and a, you know, what became a Radisson room. And so that's an example of a, I think, a great partnership. There was a lot of ways they could leverage media together. Another one was uh, a client, Carmex Lip Balm, um, small family-owned company from uh, Milwaukee. And uh, we found out uh, in video that uh, during uh, basketball games, LeBron James was actually uh, dipping in his jar of Carmex and using Carmex lip balm right before every game. And uh, we were able to, and and by the way, you know, nobody's got bigger agreements than LeBron does, you know, in terms of Nike or Gatorade or other sponsorships. And the idea of how could little Carmex partner with LeBron 
Well, we ended up just starting small and saying, you know what, let's connect websites and let's do some digital things with LeBron. And uh, and that partnership ended up uh, getting all kinds of PR and all kinds of exposure for CarMax uh, over the next several years. And uh, so the list, you know, kind of goes on. But I would just say for most business owners there, you think about your own business, but are there some friends out there? Are there some uh, other businesses where when combined with your product or your service, one plus one really equals three? So, and we can help. That's really a great idea because you get the ability for both sides to strategically develop. And it's it's really creative because a lot of people can think widely about what will be good with them. That's a great suggestion. You obviously offer a great amount of services. You're a trusted quite like partner, you know, Mark, we're, we're obviously lucky to have, you know, someone like you that is, you know, sort of in the, the wide quite like family. So people wanted to read at, reach out to you at Alphas Marketing. Tell us how they get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean, it could be sim as simple as uh, an email or a phone call or, or through the website. But I would say uh, um, you can email me directly. It's it's khodgden at altiselevates.com. And I'm, I'm guessing we can provide that to people who are listening. So, Oh, yeah, for sure. We'll definitely have a link on the site. I appreciate you coming into the Quiet Light Podcast today. It was awesome having you on. And if if you want to reach out, make sure to look Kirk up. Then, you know, we'll be in a situation where we can send you some clients and hopefully these people have some success either in e-commerce or in retail. Kirk, I appreciate you coming on the Quiet Light Podcast today. It was great having you. Hey, Pat, uh, enjoyed it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Hopefully I get up there soon and we can all have breakfast. Let's sit down with Mark. I love hanging out with him anyway. It's a deal. All right. All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks for being here. Thank you.